Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. <clears throat> Today we finish the reproduction cycle of viruses, and we end with assembly. We're going to build some viruses today. This quote is very relevant because anatomy is destiny. When you look at a virus particle, you can pretty much figure out how it's formed. So here we have lots of different kinds of virus particles, but as you've learned, we can figure out how they are built. They're, they're in a couple of different classes, three different classes, right? The number three train. So today we're gonna say, if you look at an envelope virus or an icosahedral virus, you should be able to figure out how it's built. All the viruses we're gonna talk about have a similar series of assembly reactions with a couple of exceptions. So for example, you make the individual proteins by protein synthesis, of course, one or several viral proteins, right? Some viruses can have just one protein, some can have several. You assemble the protein shell, you package the nucleic acid genome. We're gonna be talking about these today, assembly of the shell, where that happens and how, and, and packaging of just the nucleic acid of the virus and nothing else. You don't want cellular nucleic acid in there, right? That would be a waste. Release from the host cell, some, some viruses are done. Icosahedral viruses are finished at that point. They can be released from the host cell. But some viruses have to acquire an envelope. So this is a side uh, part here which doesn't apply to every virus. And then they get released from the host cell. And in fact, some viruses mature outside of the cell. We're, we'll talk about one of those today, retroviruses, but there are others as well, and then all those particles that are made go on to infect the new cell. So very similar series of events, and we'll go over these today for different kinds of viruses. Now, just like every other step in virus reproduction, assembly is dependent on the host cell. And these are some of the things that it depends on, having chaperones, which are proteins in the cell that make sure things go properly. It's just like a human chaperone, right? If you need a chaperone with you because you're too young, they have to make sure things go well. It's the same thing here. We have to make sure that proteins fold properly. We have to assist in the folding. Those are chaperones. Uh, transport systems to get viral parts, say, from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and the other way as well. The secretory pathway plays a big role because for those viruses that are enveloped, they need to tap into the secretory pathway in order to get their envelope, in order to put glycoproteins in it. We'll see that today. And of course, the nucleus, a special case where there are specific pores because otherwise you can't get through the nuclear membrane. And there's a whole import and export machinery that takes things in and, and puts them out again dependent on having the right signals. As you remember from very early on, cells are crowded. They're full of molecules of all sorts. And so there have to be specific mechanisms to move the viral components around. We talked a bit about those in virus entry, the microtubules and the motor proteins that go up and down the microtubules. But here I just summarize basically what we talked about earlier. There are mechanisms that move things short distances, you know, angstroms to nanometers like um, pores at the plasma membrane. Virus particles can go through those, and that's a very short distance, or virus components, or even endocytosis just through the membrane is a short distance. And then longer distance, mic micrometers to meters, that will depend on microtubules, which are shown here uh, in red. And, and on the right is an experiment to illustrate the, the importance of microtubules in a virus assembly. So these are cells infected with VSV, vesicular stomatitis virus, an envelope negative stranded RNA virus. And this, this is stained with three different dyes. The blue is DAPI to stain the DNA, so you see where the nucleus is. And then the red is an antibody against tubulin. And so you can see the tubular network going from the plasma membrane to the nucleus. And then the, um, the yellow is a viral protein, nuclear protein, the viral VSV nucleoprotein. So you can see on the top in an in infected cell, the 
nuclear protein is moving all over the place. And this is microtubule dependent because if you inhibit microtubules with a drug, there's a drug called nicotazole, which will disrupt my microtubules. That's what was added to the cell on the bottom. Mm -hmm. You can see that the nuclear protein doesn't get anywhere. It remains localized in big patches. It never goes to the plasma membrane where it needs to go for new virus particles to be made. So this microtubule dependent transport also works on getting viruses out of the cell. All viruses concentrate their components in some way in the cell because nothing happens fast in dilute solutions. And so you can see the consequence of this by microscopy. You can often see what we call factories or inclusions in the cell, which are nothing more than where the viruses are being assembled. Often the RNA is made there and the viruses are assembled to keep everything in one place because that way you can put all the components there and they're not all, all throughout the cytoplasm and having to be found. And so here are two examples of inclusion bodies. On the left uh, is an electron micrograph of a cell infected with poliovirus. Now in poliovirus infected cells, after so many hours, all of the membranes in the cell, the ER and the Golgi are, are disrupted, they're gone. So you don't see any ER and Golgi in this cell. And those membranes are repurposed to form double membraned vesicles, uh, which are the sites of virus RNA synthesis and assembly. The little black dots are newly formed poliovirus particles but the bigger vesicle, vesicles, which have two membranes, those are the resynthesized Golgi and ER. So these are focal places where RNA is synthesized. And the RNA gets synthesized on the surface of these membranes. We'll talk about that next time, actually. And the purpose of this is to concentrate everything you need, the polymerase, the cofactors, and all of that goes to one place as opposed to being diffused throughout the cell. You can see that that would be an inefficient process. On the right is an inclusion in a cell infected with rabies virus. These are called Negri bodies after some Italian pathologist who discovered them, you know, like Golgi was an Italian something and all these names are, and I can make fun of Italians because I am one, okay? so it's no problem. But I'm not actually making fun of them, I'm just telling you the names Negri was an Italian pathologist who looked at people who died of rabies in their central nervous system. And here's a light micrograph of a neuron in the brain of someone who died of rabies. And these dark dots are Negri bodies. Those are places where, VS, where rabies virus is being assembled. Everything happens in one place. Now, if you have a sharp eye, you will note that this, this neuron has a problem right? It's got space around it, which isn't normal. And that's because it's dying and it's shrinking. Okay, so the, the, the sections of the brain should look beautifully smooth with no holes. And this is one kind of hole that's a problem. And we'll talk later about diseases caused by prions, where your brain looks like a sponge. It's got so many holes in it. And this is all not good. Not good to have uh, holes in your brain. Now to get to the right places in the cell, viral proteins have addresses or addresses, addresses. They have membrane targeting si signals, which we're gonna talk about today. Uh, they can have signal sequences, which get them through the ER membrane. They can also have fatty acid modifications that target them to other membranes. They have membrane retention signals. So some proteins made in the ER don't need to leave. They don't have to go through the vesicular transport pathway. They need to stay in the ER. And so they have signals that keep them there. We have nuclear localization sequences to get into the nucleus and nuclear export signals to get out. So traffic in the nucleus, highly regulated. Uh, only proteins have nuclear import sequences. And here's two examples of them. Here's a simple one. In the T antigen of SV40, that's a protein, well, all the proteins are made in the cytosol, right? They have to be imported into the nucleus. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven amino acids. That's it. And that sequence, hydrophobic, basic hydrophobic, is enough to get any protein into the nucleus. You could take those seven amino acids and put it into your protein of choice and it would get into the nucleus 
because it's recognized by the nuclear import machinery. And on the bottom is a longer uh, import signal from a cellular protein, nucleoplasmin. Now, if you were a nucleic acid, you're out of luck, right? Because you don't have amino acids, ah, unless you bind to a protein. So that's how viral nucleic acids get into cells. They bind some protein. We'll see an example of that today. So here's an overview of some, some of the localizations that occur in virus infection. So this is a mishmash of, uh, of different viruses here. This is a cell with a nucleus, of course, of endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus. And here we have, for example, influenza virus nuclear protein made in the cytosol. It has a nuclear localization signal, gets into the nucleus, needs to go there because that's where RNA synthesis happens. So it goes in there and grabs RNAs and then it's gonna come out again. So it has a nuclear export signal. Uh, what else do we have here? We have some SV40 proteins, capsid proteins being assembled in the cytosol. Um, they have nuclear import signals. They have to go in there to make the capsid and, and take up viral DNA. Here's the adenovirus hexon being assembled in the cytosol. It's also imported into the nucleus. Here's a, a parvovirus trimer of VP2. So as these proteins are made, they fold properly and then they're imported into the nucleus. And they're all small enough that they can fit through uh, the nuclear pore. So that's not an issue. And then we have targeting proteins to plasma membrane. So we have the secretory system here where that's, where that's illustrated. Now, many viruses uh, will bud from the plasma membrane as you see and acquire an envelope that way. Not all viruses do. So we'll see an example of that later. But here's a virus that is going uh, to the plasma membrane. The, the spike protein in this case is made in the endoplasmic reticulum. It's, it's exported into uh, vesicles that transport the protein through the Golgi. And, the, and then at the other side of the Golgi, the uh, vesicles reform and carry the fusion protein up to the plasma membrane. So that's the secretory protein transport system at work there to get the protein from the ER to the plasma membrane. As I said, some proteins need to stay in the ER. Some viruses bud out of the ER. So they have ER retention signals. So they don't automatically go into the vesicular transport pathway. So these proteins in the ER, they become part of a vesicle that buds off from the ER and then they get transported up uh, to the plasma membrane. Now, a key concept in assembly of virus particles is this idea of sub-assemblies. I think of an automobile assembly line where the, this brilliant idea apparently of Henry Ford was you don't just start making a car and have 20 people assembling it and they finish it and then you make another one. You have an assembly line where there's a conveyor belt and one put, person puts on a wheel, another person puts on a door handle, et cetera. You get the picture as you move down the line. We do the same thing with viruses. Viruses invented it first. As far as I know, Henry Ford wasn't a virologist, so he just thought of it on his own, but that's, you know, that's independent evolution. That's okay. Subassemblies happen all the time. Here's an example for a bacteriophage. We have uh, these numbers on this slide are individual proteins. So the, the phage people give their proteins numbers. And so we have a lot of numbers going to form the base plate. Uh, sorry, a lot of proteins <laughs> going to form the base plate. And then the, uh, the, sh the shaft that's going to be inside the helical uh, tail and then proteins around it. And all of these come together. So it's like an assembly line. You're making the parts and putting them together. And then you have at the same time the capsid being assembled from uh, capsid proteins, of course. And then the two are put together. Now you have a, a head uh, docked onto a tail. Uh, and then you can add tail fibers, which are added, which are made in a separate pathway. So that's what I mean by sub-assemblies. You're making a tail, you're making a head, you're making tail fibers. These are inter discrete intermediate structures. Now, why is this done? It's efficient. You get orderly formation of particles, just like with the car. If you're having 20 people working on a car in one place, very inefficient. You make individual sub-assemblies and put them together. But more importantly, I think, this enables quality control. And that is, 
if you make a tail that's broken, it never gets incorporated into the virus particle. So you can reverse it. And that's the role of chaperones to say, this tail is not properly formed. It's going to be degraded and never incorporated with the head. So quality control is built into this subassembly process. So here are three ways that you can make a subassembly. And the top first, you can make individual protein molecules. So we're making an SV40 pentamer. The building block of the SV40 capsid is a pentamer, right? Five copies of VP1, same protein. And so that protein VP1 is translated, of course, from viral mRNAs. They assemble uh, into a pentamer. And that's a subassembly because it's only part of the whole virus part. But there's also a minor protein here, uh, VP23, that we haven't talked about. That's at the central part of the pentamer, but it's also made in the same way. It's translated and then made into this subassembly. So this is a spontaneously occurring subassembly where the proteins are made and they fold into the right conformation to make this pentamer. Sometimes you have a polyprotein precursor. So with SV40, we make the individual proteins by translating individual mRNAs. And with the polyprotein, you make one long protein and it's cleaved by proteases. So this happens with poliovirus. The capsid proteins are made as a long precursor. The first one third of the genome encodes this long precursor. And you can see it here, VP1, VP2, VP3, and VP4. There are four capsid proteins that make up the, uh, the virus particle. There are actually three, right? This is a pseudo T equals three because instead of identical subunits, you know, uh, 180 copies of one protein, there are 180 copies of three different proteins, 60 each. VP4 is really just an N-terminal extension of VP2, but we say there are four capsid proteins. They're, they're made in a single polypeptide, as you can see in the middle there, they fold. So we have folded P1. The P1 is the name for this precursor. So we have VP1, VP2, and VP3 and 4. And then a viral protease, 3CD Pro, cuts the loops between them to make the final structural unit, which is then gonna go on to assemble and, and make virus particles. Okay, so that's another kind of a sub-assembly because it's only, it's the structural unit of the virus particle. And now at the bottom, we have chaperone-assisted assembly. So we've had individual protein molecules, polyprotein precursors, and then a little twist, which could apply to any of those, when you need a chaperone to make sure the proteins fold properly. In fact, all of these sub-assemblies need chaperones. None of them can do it on their own. And this one is the hexon trimer, which is a trimer of protein two, and it requires the L400 kilodalton protein, as you can see there, as a chaperone. It's a viral chaperone that makes sure everything is folded properly to form that, that subassembly, which is the hexon trimer. Here's some more examples of chaperones. Here, they're, they're cellular chaperones. And um, two different viruses. At the top, we have a retrovirus where the structural precursor, it's a polyprotein precursor. It's, it's called GAG. Remember, GAG, Paul, and Envelope were the three proteins for the, of the simple retrovirus. So this is the structural protein precursor. Here's a GAG drawn schematically. The, the nascent GAG, well, it's just a, a line essentially, but in, with the help of a cellular chaperone called TRIC, T-R-I-C, uh, this, this folds into the proper configuration, uh, which has a number of different proteins. It has um, the nuclear protein, the capsid protein, uh, the matrix protein, and, and this is a single, single GAG protein and then multiple gag proteins align to form this curved structure. This is all happening at the membrane of the cell. Uh, and these are also assisted by another chaperone, ABCE1. And all of these are energy dependent processes. The chaperones require energy. And you can see eventually um, you make a closed shell with the viral RNA in it. So we have matrix protein on the outside. We have the capsid protein uh, in red nuclear protein in blue, and then the viral RNA is in there. How that gets assembled, we'll see in a little bit more detail. 
just right at this point, know that that's a cellular chaperone mediated process. Same thing for SV40. This uh, pentamer, which we saw being built previously, has to be incorporated into a virus particle. So each of these colored uh, subunits are, are pentamers. There's one purple and then the others are all in different colors. In order for that subassembly to get put into the virus, you need two chaperones, HSC70, which is a cellular chaperone. And look, large T antigen, another role for large T. Remember, large T uh, gets DNA synthesis going. It's a transcriptional regulator, it makes the cells divide, and now you can see it's a chaperone for proper assembly. So really a, a remarkable protein. Now, there are two kinds of assembly when we make virus particles we're gonna talk about. One of them is sequential capsid assembly. And sometimes they're mixed. The second one, concerted, we'll see in a moment. So here's poliovirus, which undergoes sequential capsid assembly. This is basically making subassemblies and putting them together in a sequence. So here we have the virus uh, binding its receptor coming into the cell. The RNA is extruded into the cytoplasm, right? It can be translated into proteins. And the P1 region, it's, it's one long polyprotein. And the P1 region encodes the capsid protein, which folds into the structural unit like we just saw. And this makes pentamers. So five of those assemble to form a pentamer, which then associate with the viral RNA to make a virus particle. So stepwise assembly, you make a 5S structural unit, which is one, then you make five of those together, which is a pentamer, and then you finally take 12 pentamers and make the virus pen particle. That's what I mean by sequential capsid assembly, one step at a time. Here's another example of that for a herpes virus, a, a larger envelope of viruses, of course. This is a DNA virus, so the DNA replicates in the nucleus, so the capsid has to be assembled in the nucleus. I don't know the, the reason for that, now that I think about it. Why don't we take the DNA and put it in the cytoplasm? I, I suspect DNA replication and assembly are coupled, and the DNA replication happens in the cytoplasm. But here, you have many uh, proteins that are needed to make a herpes virus particle. You can see pentamers of VP5, hexamers of VP5, and a variety of other proteins as well. Here's a portal. So this, this is assembled in the cytosol. These are all made in the cytoplasm and shipped through the nuclear pores. They all have nuclear localization sequences. And then in the nucleus, uh, first you make a procapsid, which has the pentamers and hexamers forming the icosahedral shell. These triplexes are, are in between, giving uh, some, some additional stability. Uh, and then inside of the capsid, before the DNA gets in, is a protein scaffold uh, consisting of VP22, VP24, and 21. That's what all these different proteins are in here. You need a scaffold because without it, the, you, couldn't, you couldn't assemble this particle. It's too big kind of like the scaffold on the outside of a building, except this is inside. And at some point, one of these scaffold components, VP24, is also a protease. And so when the capsid is completed, the protease is triggered and all of the scaffold internally is digested proteolytically, which as you can see there by the little bits of protein left. And then the genome goes in through the portal. And so in this uh, final, uh, picture here, you have the double-stranded DNA in the particle. It goes through the portal and all these bits of proteins come out. So again, it's, it's sequential assembly with a little twist or a few twists because it's happening in the nucleus and it happens on a really big virus. Then we have concerted assembly where things happen at once. Think of a concert where everybody has to, in the orchestra, has to play together, right? Concerted assembly. Here, th there are some sequential parts of this, but in the end to make the virus particle, it, only, it comes together with the genome at one step, and then you make that virus particle. You make parts first, and then the genome, the particle is assembled only in association with the viral genome. So here we have a very complicated reproduction scheme, but basically mm, we have viral RNAs being made in the nucleus, they are then exported through the pore because they have proteins on them. 
and some of those proteins have nuclear export signals, and those proteins target the RNA to the plasma membrane. They have signals in them that target it to the plasma membrane. At the same time, the viral glycoproteins, the HA, the NA, the, uh, the M1 protein, the channel, those are all made, oh, HA and NA are made on ER. M1 is attached uh, to the, the viral RNA. M2 is the channel, that's also made in the ER. Here it is right there, that little double protein. So those are made in the ER and they're shipped up to the plasma membrane in a secretory vesicle. vesicle and they end up at the plasma membrane, as you can see here, the HA and the NA and the uh, M2 stuck in the membrane. And then those eight RNPs that went there bud out. So that's the concerted part. This virus particle forms all, all together by assembly of the proteins and the, um, the, the viral envelope. So these uh, spike glycoproteins are very special, as we've already seen. They're in the envelope. They're important for binding to cell receptors. So let's just take a look at one of them, the hemagglutinin of influenza virus. We've seen this binding its receptor sialic acid and bringing the particle into the cell, undergoing a conformational change to trigger fusion. And so here are the hemagglutinin molecules in the virus particle, the purple uh, lollipop looking things. There are lots of them. Uh, and um, there's a second one, the neuraminidase, which we'll talk about later. Here's the structure of the HA. It's a trimer and it is perpendicular to the plasma membrane. And remember the, the receptor binding portion is at the very top. This protein, a single unit, a, a monomer of HA is shown down here at the bottom. So it is got a transmembrane sequence, a hydrophobic stretch of amino acids that embeds it in the viral membrane. And there's a short piece of, of protein at the C-terminus in the virus itself. And then we have the, the long HA protein shown here in red. You can see there are lots of disulfide bonds uh, throughout this protein. There are many sites for glycosylation, those little Ys, oligosaccharides. And the reason this is highly disulfide bonded is to maintain the structure, but also here is the fusion peptide in green. That's the, that's the peptide that has to insert into the endosome membrane to catalyze fusion when the pH drops. So it's hidden at the base of the HA. It's somewhere down there. And in the native HA, it's not even available. It's, it's, un, it's uncleaved. And this little orange arrowhead uh, means that a protease has to cleave it in order for it to be released at low pH. And that, that's a cellular protease that does it. But once it's cleaved, this part here called uh, HA1 from the end terminus to the cleavage site, it would fall off if it weren't disulfide bonded to the rest of the protein. So this disulfide bond here, this long one, from an amino acid near the end terminus to an amino acid near the C terminus, that holds the two subunits together after the cleavage happens. And then of course the pH drops in the endosome, the top part of the HA falls away, the fusion peptide goes up and that catalyzes fusion. Uh, a little bit more on the HA, just to illustrate what happens to glycoproteins in general. So these again are made when ribosomes attach to the endoplasmic reticulum. These are special proteins that have an N-terminal signal sequence that direct the ribosomes to dock onto the ER. The um, proteins are then translated into the lumen of the ER and then they begin their movement towards the plasma membrane. So they're shed from the ER in vesicles. That's the vesicular transport pathway. They move through the stacks of the Golgi, again, by fusing, by being released, by fusing, by being released, until they eventually fuse with the plasma membrane. And then the proteins are displayed in the plasma membrane so that a new virus particle can be formed. As the HA moves through, the ER and the Golgi, many modifications occur. Like the protein oligomerizes in the Golgi, oligosaccharides are added and removed throughout this process. The sugars, of course, are, are important for folding of proteins and for many of their biological activities. And so here is where they are properly put on by a series of enzymes uh, that are present in the Golgi. Uh, and then the, the native 
HA here. Here you can see that this HA molecule has a transmembrane domain. Yeah, the the C-terminus is also actually anchored in the membrane by a, a fatty acid. And then the extra, extra virus part of the uh, HA or the extracellular part is shown at the bottom. You can see the disulfide bond that holds the HA1 and HA2 together. It's already been cleaved here, uh, exposing the fusion peptide. So that's what happens in the, um, uh, in the transport pathway, the vesicular transport pathway. Uh, our first question is, uh, subassemblies are involved in which of the following types of virus particle production? Concerted assembly, sequential assembly, assembly lines, chaperone assisted assembly, all of the above. So which are involved in uh, virus particle production? What do we do? I thought this would be 100. <laughs> So they're all involved, right? Concerted, <coughs> sequential, assembly lines, chaperone-assisted, everything. We talked about them individually in all the slides, so the answer is all of the above. Now, let's, the next problem I want to deal with is genome packaging. How to distinguish the viral genome from the cellular R RNA and, and DNA. Cells have RNA and DNA, looks chemically similar, but virus particles typically only package their own genome. And this is because there are signals in the genome called packaging signals. So packaging is the process of putting nucleic acids in the particle. And to do that, there's a signal on the, part, on the genome that directs it. So here's an example of a, a retrovirus budding from the plasma membrane there at the top. And there is um, viral RNA in it only. And that's because it's binding one of the proteins that's in the virus particle. So let's see how this works for uh, DNA and RNA viruses. So in DNA genomes, there are packaging signals, or as we call them here. We have adenovirus at the top and SV40 below it. And we are looking at adenovirus at the left end here. Here's an inverted terminal repeat on the left. There's an origin, right? Because this is where DNA, one of the places where DNA synthesis begins. Um, then we have our packaging signals here before the first promoter. Here's the E1A promoter, the very first one to be active when the DNA gets in the nucleus. It's only 500 bases from the left end. And here are packaging sequences. There are a number of them in dark blue, as you can see, they're repeated. So they're near the left end. Uh, and this is also the origin of replication, of course. It's, it's a series of uh, overlapping sequences with other signals in the genome. And those sequences, these packaging sequences, uh, bind viral proteins that, and you can see this viral DNA that's getting into the capsid on this bottom figure here. It has a number of proteins on it. These are the proteins here. Not so important for you to know them. Simply to know there are viral proteins bound to the viral DNA via these packaging sequences, and then those proteins are needed to get into uh, the capsid. And at the bottom is SV40. Similar situation. Here's the early uh, transcription unit, T antigen, and here's the origin of replication. And just to the left is the packaging signal, which overlaps with uh, these binding sites for the transcriptional uh, regulator SP1. So again, this packaging signal is recognized by the viral structural proteins to pull the uh, genome into the particle. So packaging sequences on DNA genomes. Uh, herpes has also packaging signals, and I want to illustrate this to tell you how, to, how we resolve the concatamers that are made by DNA replication. If you remember, the rolling circle model of viral DNA replication gives you a number, a very long DNA with lots of genome length units in it. So how do you get those cut? Well, here, here's what happens. Uh, there are packaging sequences uh, here at the left end uh, of the viral uh, DNA, and these are shown expanded below here, DR1, PAC, DR2, PAC2, DR1, and so forth. But what happens is, as this concatameric DNA is made, these packaging sequences in the DNA, which are now shown uh, colored, well, they correspond to the expansion on the left, like DR2 is orange, there's, there's DR2. 
Uh, these packaging signals interact with viral proteins at the portal. So they interact with the portal, they interact with all these other three other proteins here that are attached to the portal. So the DNA binds those specifically because they have the, these packaging sequences in them. The portal is a motor. It's an energy dependent motor that pulls the DNA into the capsid once it's bound to the portal. And you can see that happening in step two and step three and four and so forth. And there are once, so this originally happened when a packaging sequence bound to the portal. But of course, since this is concatomeric, there are many units of DNA in this one molecule. Eventually you're gonna reach another packaging sequence. And that's what we're seeing in step three. Now we have pulled a second packaging sequence there, and it's aligned with the first packaging sequence, which has remained bound to the portal. And at that point, an endonuclease cuts the DNA, releases it, and now what we have in the capsid is a unit length genome. And that's defined by the presence of these packaging signals. So they're at the left end, so as soon as you reach another packaging signal, that means you're at the end of the genome, and you cut it, during the packaging. This DNA, by the way, is packaged in the particle at very high pressures, hundreds of pounds per square inch. You know, if you inflate a tire, it's like 30 to 40 pounds per square inch, right? If you did 600, it would blow up. If you inflate a bicycle tire, right? I've had them blow up on me. This is 600 pounds per square inch. It's amazing. The capsule is very hard. So why is that? because when the portal docks on the nucleus and the entry, then the DNA comes shooting out, just like phage. It's the same thing, they're packaged. The DNA is packaged under very high pressure uh, in the phage particle. So those pumps, the portal, for example, pump is amazing. It's an amazing molecular pump that just winds the DNA at very high pressure. Here are packaging signals in RNA genomes. We're gonna start with HIV and retroviruses. Um, so here, is, is the, the diagram of the left end of the HIV mRNA. So the mRNA is packaged into the HIV particle, right? And there is a packaging sequence here called Psi for packaging. And um, it's essential for packaging, although you, you need some other signals as well. It's a very structured region, uh, as you can see here. This particular part of this structured region, SL1, stem loop one, interacts with a separate RNA via the kissing loop, and that keeps two RNAs together, as you can see down here on the right. So they're bound by this kissing loop sequence. Now this, uh, this genome, this packaging signal, is going to bind the nucleocapsid protein of the virus. So that's the specific virus protein that will bring the genome into the virus particle, and that sequence is not present in cellular RNAs, so we don't package uh, any cellular RNAs. And this, this nucleocapsid protein has regions that are important for specific binding of RNA and which leads to packaging in vivo. And so basically this packaging sequence is binding the nucleocapsid protein. And so now you see here, there are two molecules of RNA in green on the right, and they're bound to nucleocapsid protein, uh, which is holding them there. And this will assemble into a virus particle as we'll see uh, in a moment. So that's the packaging sequence for uh, a specific retrovirus. Segmented genomes have a special problem, which is if you have eight segments, say an influenza virus, how do you make sure you get all the right eight into a particle? And there are two ways you could do this. You could be random. You could just grab eight segments. So inside of a cell, there are lots of RNA segments being reproduced independently, right? In influenza viruses, they're made in the nucleus, shipped out into the cytosol. So the cytosol is full of eight different RNAs floating around. So you can imagine, just grab any eight. And if you do that, you would get one infectious particle per 400, if you do the math, which is within the known ratio of particles to PFU for influenza virus. So random could actually work. It doesn't work for every virus though, it works for this one. I think it's coincidence because there is evidence for specific packaging sequences on each RNA segment, even for uh, influenza virus. So maybe there's a contribution of randomness and non-randomness, but for influenza virus, what, what has been discovered is that at the ends of each RNA segment, there are specific sequences that make sure 
that segment gets into the particle and assures that the others get in as well. So here are the eight RNA segments of the influenza virus. So every infectious particle has to have these eight. If it's missing one, it's not infectious. And they have at their end sequences, they're, they're in white letters here, and the, the numbers are different lengths. Those are the packaging sequences that make sure they interact with viral proteins to get in the particle and with each other to make sure all eight segments get into the particle. So how does it prevent multiple? So actually it doesn't up to a certain point because it doesn't harm infectivity to have extra. But at some point you can't fit any more physically in so you don't get more than a certain number. But if you had extra HAs or others, it doesn't seem, you can do that experimentally and show that it doesn't really matter. So these RNAs, again, they interact with viral proteins, they interact with each other to, to get incorporated. And, and you can see that if you take electron micrographs of influenza virus particles and you make an optical section through the particles, you can see here, they're inside the particle, there are all these dots, right? Those are the RNAs all perpendicular to the section and parallel to each other because of these packaging sequences. So you see the model at the top, the RNAs, and we're only showing four here, are parallel to each other. And they end up being taken into the particle because of those interactions. So the RNAs are interacting not just with viral proteins, but with each other to make sure you get the right number in. And they're parallel, so make it, when you make an optical section of, of this EM, you see the, the, the RNAs in cross section. Finally, there are examples of what we call selective packaging. Here is a virus, it's a bacteriophage called Phi6, which has three double-stranded segments of RNA. They're called SM and L, small, medium, and large. They're three different sizes. So here's a, a diagram of the particle. Uh, remember, these real viruses have two capsids. They have an outer and an inner shell, and those are shown here. And inside, you can see the three RNAs, the large, uh, the medium, and the small. And these get in by serial dependence. In other words, the first RNA that is packaged is the small RNA by protein-RNA interactions. Only that one can go in first. And if that's in there, if the small RNA is in, then mRNA will go in, and then finally L. So there's a sequence, there's an order in which these RNAs have to get in the capsid. L can't go first, M can't go first. If you put M S in, then only M will follow and not L, and it's based on the sequences uh, in the genomes and the proteins that they interact with. Now this virus is very interesting. It has a particle to PFU ratio of one which means every particle that's made is infectious. And it may be because of this serial dependence of packaging. So it could be that packaging is the limit, one of the big limiting steps for making an infectious particle and that other viruses don't do it as well. I mean, even influenza viruses is, is one in 400. So even though you have these signals, there's some aspect of packaging that's random and causes errors. But this one is perfect and it must be the, the serial dependence. So those are the different ways that you can get uh, genomes specifically into virus particles. And that leads us to our next question, which is packaging signals on viral what blank interact with viral what during virus assembly? Packaging signals interact, and then we have pairs of words that you put in, lipids, proteins, proteins, subassemblies, genomes, proteins, proteases, membranes, and proteins, genomes. So what's, what is the right pair of uh, words to put in there? Well, let's see how we did. So the right uh, words are packaging signals on viral genomes interact with viral proteins during virus assemblies. <clears throat> assembly. So some people put proteins but the packaging signals are on the genomes. <clears throat> so that's the only one that, that is possible. Let's talk about how to get uh, an envelope or a membrane. And for most viruses, the envelope is acquired 
after you make internal structures like influenza virus, you make the RNPs, the RNA bound to proteins, you bring them up to the plasma membrane, and then the particle buds from the surface. But for some viruses, it happens at the same time. The assembly occurs during the budding process, and that's retroviruses, as you can see here, as you will see in a moment. Now, in the bottom are different situations where the budding is driven by different viral components. So, for example, on the left, for some viruses, if you just make the capsid protein and the say glycoprotein in a cell in the absence of anything else. So just make two specific viral proteins, you can get particles made. They're gonna be empty, of course, but you, that tells you that all that's needed to drive budding is the capsid and the glycoprotein. And that's the situation for alpha viruses, like some of these encephalitis viruses and leaky forest virus that we talked about. Now, why would you wanna know this? But if you wanna make vectors, to deliver genes, this is good information to know. You know exactly what you need to make a particle. For some viruses, retroviruses, either the matrix, so the matrix protein or M protein is this interesting protein in many envelope viruses that's just below the membrane and it gives structure to the particle. Otherwise, the, the, without this, the particle would be very flimsy and probably fall apart. So the matrix protein is a shell lining the membrane and that can drive budding for some viruses or the capsid protein by itself. In some cases, the envelope alone will drive budding, influenza virus and coronavirus. So for influenza virus, you can take uh, the, the gene encoding the HA and make it in cells and culture and it will make particles with HA in them. And that's been exploited to make vaccines in, in uh, mammalian cells and in plants actually you can make influenza virus vaccines just by making the HA protein. <clears throat> it will give rise to particles. And then the last situation here, uh, the, the matrix protein is essential, but you need other components like glycoprotein, sometimes even the genome for uh, efficiency or accuracy. So this just gives you an idea of what's driving the budding of these particles. Now, the budding process itself is a, <clears throat> subversion of a normal cellular process. So here's influenza virus budding. We have the ribonucleoproteins, right? They're assembled in the nucleus. They're exported into the cytoplasm. They have a signal that targets them to the plasma membrane. And in that plasma membrane, the HA and the NA and the M2 protein have been inserted. And then the bud forms and eventually it pinches off and you, you form new virus particles. So this is concerted assembly, as we said, right? You make uh, the, the RNP separately, you make the plasma membrane proteins, and then the particle is formed in one step, the budding step. Here are some signals that direct this process. So these are two different viruses here, the influenza virus M1 protein and the VSV M protein. So these are functionally analogous proteins of two different viruses. And these proteins are typically underneath the membrane, as I said. So here you can see for the influenza virus, it's that blue protein. So many, many proteins forming a shell beneath the membrane. The M1 of influenza virus has, of course it has a nuclear localization signal to get it in. It has a nuclear export signal to get it out. It has a part that binds to the RNP. So the M1 is shown as this blue block here. It binds to the RNP. And then it has some hydrophobic regions that are responsible for its being targeted to the plasma membrane. So here, hydrophobic regions, it's required for lipid binding and membrane binding. So that's how the M1 is targeted to the membrane. Same thing with VSVM. It has a region that's binding to the RNAs, and it also has a hydrophobic region that's important for it, directing this to the plasma membrane. So this is how these proteins are targeted by these hydrophobic sequences. Now here's how a retrovirus buds, and this illustrates how maturation actually occurs after the budding process. So for influenza virus, the capsid is preformed, the nucleocapsid is preformed and then it drives the budding. But here you're gonna see 
the maturation occurring after the budding. So let's start with the GAG protein, which is shown here, right? The GAG is the structural protein precursor. It consists of the matrix protein. The matrix is blue. It's the protein that's underneath the membrane. We have the capsid protein. It's going to form the icosahedral shell, which you can see in the final particle number four there. We have the nucleocapsid protein, which is binding the RNA. The nucleocapsid recognizes the packaging signal in the RNA. And then we have P6, whose function we'll see in a minute. P6 actually brings the, the genome to uh, the, the bud. We'll, we'll look at that in a moment. But what happens here, so GAG is made as a polyprotein. And here it is in a different form with matrix capsid, nucleocapsid, and P6 right there. And that molecule will pick up RNA by binding the nucleocapsid protein. So the nucleocapsid is in yellow. And then there are membrane targeting signals on the matrix protein that will bring the protein up to the plasma membrane with its RNA. And then you can see multiple, multiple uh, polygag proteins are lining up under the membrane by virtue of the M protein association. There, there's also a, a spike protein inserted into the membrane. This eventually buds out. And then, after the virus particle is budded, there's a protease in this capsid, which cleaves proteins and forms the icosahedral shell. It matures it, as you can see here. So it, it matures after budding. Where does the protease come from? The ribosome, uh, when it's translating the viral RNA, mostly makes gag protein, and then it hits a stop codon. But about five to 10% of the time, there is suppression of the stop codon by suppressor tRNAs, so that you get translating longer, and then you make a gag Paul fusion. So the Paul part has the RT and the integrase. So now we have matrix capsid, nucleocapsid, P6, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and then protease up there, the white one. And some of these get incorporated into the growing bud as well, and that accounts for RT and protease and integrase in the particle, and that protease is what eventually cleaves the immature particle to make it mature. So this is how retrovirus particles are formed by these interactions. This is how the RNA gets into them. This is how the particles mature after uh, they have budded from the cell. And if you just produced gag protein in a cell, it will make a particle. You don't need the Paul part to make a particle. And that's exploited to make vectors for gene therapy, which we will talk about later. So how does, um, may, how does GAG get to the plasma membrane? It's very similar to influenza M and VSV M. But in this case, it's a mix of hydrophobic sequences and a meristate. So here's GAG, matrix capsid, nucleocapsid, P6. And it has RNA binding regions, which are gonna interact with the packaging signal on the RNA. But at the end terminus, it's meristylated. Meristate is a fatty acid that's covalently linked to the end terminus of GAG, and that targets it to the plasma membrane. It's like a membrane uh, signal to go to the, to the membrane. If you take away the meristate, so you can change the amino acid that meristate is attached to and prevent meristoylation, you do not get formation of particles because the gag cannot go to the plasma membrane. So this is an explanation for many things, for packaging uh, and for how you get all these proteins into the particle. Here's meristate, by the way. It's this uh, fatty acid which is covalently linked to uh, the protein. These are, this is a signal for meristoylation. Three, any three amino acids, serine, threonine, alanine, uh, N and C, so that's, that is added post-translationally and that targets it to the membrane. You don't, need an, you don't need a signal sequence. This is a signal sequence independent targeting. So the proteins are made into cytoplasm, they're modified there with meristate, and then that targets them to membranes. Now the final step, the budding itself, let's talk about that. So if you remember this, uh, this gag protein, I told you it has this P6 protein as part of it. 
And I was a little mysterious about that. And there's also for another retrovirus, a P12 in a different part. But people wanted to know years ago what these were doing. So they removed them. And when you remove P6, for example, and you infect cells that lack P6, now you get particles that form stalks and never get released from the cell. So you see in that EM, that's a cell infected with a virus defective in P6. And you bud, the buds form, the genome's in them, it's all, gag is all in there, but they never pinch off from the cell surface. So these sequences, which are found subsequently in many other viruses that bud, were called late domains because this is a late stage in virus reproduction. They're found in both plus and minus strand envelope viruses. And what they do is they bind cell proteins that are involved in vesicle trafficking. So the cell has a whole system that regulates the formation of vesicles. For example, when two cells divide, that little bit of membrane has to be pinched off and this system is responsible for that. It's very much like, cell division is very much like a bud pinching off from the plasma membrane. Similar proteins are involved. And this is called the escort pathway, ESCRT, which is shown here. And all these proteins are involved in removing, is making the bud and removing it from the cell surface. And you can see there are interactions between, say, P6 and members of these escort pathway proteins. And I think we have an illustration here. So endosomal sorting complexes required for transport, escort machinery, is responsible, say, for letting two cells split off. There is a component of escort, escort three, that basically cuts the membrane between the two cells. And in the cell, when vesicles uh, fuse with one another, members of the escort pathway are involved. And so what the retroviruses and other viruses do, they bind members of the escort pathway and divert them to the plasma membrane where they are bud, where they need to bud. And therefore that's what drives uh, the, the removal of the bud from the cell surface. So you can see here, escort three and VPS4, these are two proteins involved in uh, cutting the membrane, if you will. They are drawn to the site of virus budding by their interactions with viral protein. So the bud happens independent of escort, but that final step, the, the release of the bud, the cutting of the membrane, that's done by the escort pathway, and these proteins are brought there by interaction with viral proteins. So another example of the dependence of virus replication on the host cell. If you have if you remove P6 from GAG, you don't, as I showed you, the buds, you, re you remain with these stalks here because the uh, escort components can no longer interact with the viral proteins, so the bud cannot be resolved. And as I said, that happens for many enveloped viruses. These, the uh, abscission of the bud, let's call it, the removal, the cutting of that stalk depends on the escort pathway. And so viral proteins have to be able to interact with that. Now, <clears throat> in order to get proteins to different membranes, they have to be sorted there. And there are many different places where viral proteins can go. They can go to the plasma membrane, as we have seen, but they can also go to other membranes and bud from there. So on this slide, we see all the different places that we know that viruses can bud from besides the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane, influenza virus, many other viruses bud from there, as I've just shown you, retroviruses, but herpes viruses bud from the nuclear membrane. Vaccinia viruses and flaviviruses, coronaviruses bud from the endoplasmic reticulum. Other viruses, bunyaviruses, blood, <laughs> bud from the Golgi apparatus. So the particles are actually formed intracellularly and have to get to the cell surface by the vesicular transport uh, pathway. So here's an example for coronavirus. <clears throat> the virus is assembled uh, cytoplasmically. So here are viral genomes. So this is viral genomic RNA, the 30,000 base RNA, then it's bound up with nucleocapsid protein. And that structure in number eight 
then buds into the ergic, which is the ER Golgi intermediate compartment. It's a, it's a set of membranes between the ER and the Golgi. It sounds like you're vomiting, right? Ergic, but <laughs> that's what it's called. So they bud into the ergic and they acquire their membrane there. So the viral glycoproteins are displayed on the internal side, the lumen of the ergic. Some of them end up on the plasma membrane, but most of them are internally. And then you have a particle within the ergic and then it moves to the surface by pinching off within a vesicle, vesicular transport. The vesicle then fuses at the plasma membrane and that's what gets the particle out. So they don't bud at the plasma membrane. They bud from within the cell and then they're brought to the plasma membrane by vesicular transport. And that's how all of these viruses work that get membranes from internal parts of the cell. All right, last question. Um, which statement about budding, viral budding is incorrect? The envelope can be acquired after or simultaneous with assembly of internal components. The viral spike glycoprotein can drive budding. No host proteins are involved in the budding process. Lipids assist structural proteins to interact with the membrane. The viral membrane can be acquired from the nucleus ER, Golgi, or plasma membrane, which is wrong. All right, let's have a look. Most of you got uh, C. No host proteins are involved in budding. Of course they are, right? We just talked about the escort pathway, which is the cellular protein. Um, the viral membrane can be acquired. Yeah, it can be acquired from the nucleus, the ER, the Golgi, or the plasma membrane. It's, it's absolutely correct. And I think we're gonna see an example of that here. So here's herpes virus, which is really amazing in the, the way it gets its membrane. So it, the capsid forms in the nucleus, which is all the way here on the left. And on each of these steps, we see electron micrographs illustrating what's going on. So the capsid buds out of the nuclear membrane, which brings you to the ER. So now you have an envelope virus in the ER, but then it fuses and loses the envelope getting out of the ER, so now we back to a nucleocapsid. It then fuses in, it doesn't fuse, it acquires a membrane by budding into the trans-Golgi, and then it's, in, it's enclosed in a vesicle which transports it to the surface, and there the virus is released. So very much like coronaviruses, but, it, but this one starts in the nucleus and it loses that nuclear membrane. So the virus membrane en ends up coming from the trans-Golgi uh, network. Also, virus particles mature during export through uh, the, the ER and trans-Golgi network. So the example here is a flavivirus where the virus, this is dengue virus, where the virus particles have to have their glycoprotein flat on the surface ready for low pH release of the fusion protein. But as these particles are made in the ER, the, the pH is neutral and the proteins are slightly raised from the surface. Uh, this is the, the trimer of the spike like a protein. The red is the fusion peptide, which you need to hide. So there's a protein that protects that fusion protein during transport through these membranes so it doesn't fuse. As the pH drops in the trans-Golgi, you can see that by the yellow color there, the protein flattens on the cell surface. And then in the extracellular milieu, there are proteases that remove those protective caps. And now the fusion protein is hidden until it's released by low pH. So this is a way of setting the glycoproteins for release later at low pH. And that happens as you go through uh, the trans-Golgi network. How do viruses get out of the cell? Just briefly at the end here, uh, they can be released apically. If this is now a polarized epithelial cell in your body, has an apical and basolateral domain. They can be released by budding apically. They can sometimes fuse from cell to cell, uh, or they can do both. And if you're in a respiratory virus, you wanna be released apically to infect other people. But what about, um, Vaccinia virus has an interesting twist on this. Uh, this virus matures intracellularly. It's brought to the plasma membrane by microtubule transport. It stimulates at its release a series of phosphorylation events that cause actin to be polymerized and that thrusts these virus particles away from the cell on these long filaments so that they can go to the next cell. So it's a really interesting uh, way to release virus on these tails of actin. Now, 
Uh, Non-envelope viruses, how do they get out? There's no membrane to fuse and so forth. Well, typically they, they cause cell lysis, which is a combination of apoptosis and necroptosis and other cell death mechanisms. They make proteins that cause cell membranes to rupture. They, they make pores in membranes. You get loss of membrane integrity when you shut down cellular processes, as we'll see next time. And basically the cells rupture, as I showed you in this time course of poliovirus infection of cells, at the end the cells are all lysed. But some viruses are not released by lysis, they're actually released in vesicles. Some non-envelope viruses are released in vesicles. And so cells, when they are infected and stressed, they form auto autophagic vesicles, these double membrane vesicles, and they can encapsidate some virus particles just by accident, and they can be released non-lytically. So these are double membrane vesicles that move to the surface. Autophagy is a process where when the cell is stressed, it takes and enwraps up parts of the cytosol and exports it for use by perhaps a more fortunate cell. And sometimes the virus particles can be taken up by them. And some cells, many cells of course, release exosomes, which contain proteins and RNA, and that's a way of communication between cells. And sometimes they can contain virus particles if the cell is infected, and that would be a non-lytic release mechanism. So that ends us with the infectious cycle. I wanna do one more discussion of reproduction in cells before we move on to disease, and that is the infected cell. We're gonna take a look at everything that happens when a virus infects the cell in terms of the cellular response.